everyone, Ethan Ainsworth here. Um, primarily, I wanted to do a review of the Flash number six or seven sixty three. But first, I wanted to talk about this briefly. Um, the previous issue, of the Flash seven sixty two. So this is the end of the Joshua Williamson run. Um, and I didn't know that until after I read it, until the end of the issue. They, they, he basically says a little send off, a little thank you. Uh, and it's really sweet, but I didn't know going into this. So, um, I was, I was kind of shell shocked by, by it, but, um, I want to take a minute to acknowledge what a like dandy reference this is to old flash continuity. Like they really go all the way with referencing old flash stuff in this book. Um, first of all, the cover is a, uh, is a clear reference to this cover from 1985, I want to say. This is, um, this is actually quite a hot book for some reason. I happen to have a ton of Flash stuff, but evidently this book um, goes for quite a bit. I've seen it go for, uh, between 50 and 70 US dollars, which is quite a bit more in Canada. Um... I think the highest I've seen recently is 75 US. But anyway, in this book, they sort of reference this book. And it's about Reverse Flash more or less trying to coach Barry into killing him. And he references um, Barry's manslaughter of Reverse Flash in this comic here, uh, which I thought was interesting. This is just pre-Flashpoint. I think this is like... Or sorry, not Flashpoint. Uh, Crisis. I think this is like... A year at most before Crisis uh, on Infinite Earths where the Flash would end up giving his life to save the multiverse, which they also reference in this. Um, but yeah, it's it's a book about legacy. It's a book about relationships. It's a book about changing your past, fixing mistakes. Um, and so ultimately, the way that Flash beats Reverse Flash in this book is not by fighting him or killing him, although he almost gives into his hatred. Uh, it's not by trying to outwit him or trying to outrun him or anything like that. Barry defeats Reverse Flash by forgiving him and grounding him. Um, at, at, at much cost to himself, he risks taking away his own connection to the Speed Force in order to ground Reverse Flash and, and allow him to live a normal life without being consumed by hatred and, and constant uh, dread. And um, so F Flash basically risks his own life as the Flash to to fix his, his greatest enemy's life. Um, I thought that was really nice. It's, it's a, very much a divergence from the traditional... Uh, Flash or or the the traditional superhero story, um, so that's that issue, and that was uh, that was really great. By the way, the colors in this were awesome. Um, I'll put those to the side because we're talking about this today, the Flash number seven sixty three. By the way, I should mention that the previous issue um, seven sixty two it did feel a little bit rushed. I will say uh, as far as criticism goes, um, but that's because. Joshua Williamson was obviously very constrained because he's working with like what, 30, 32 pages, something like that. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long a DC book is. I don't think it's that much longer than a Marvel book these days. But yeah, so it's kind of hard to uh, hold them <laughs> hold them the task for that. But this is a really fun book. And um, the way The Flash actually ends up beating the trickster in this book is something I've talked about for a long time with my little brother. Uh, and it's something I would make jokes about to him because I have a flash ring um, and I won't give it away yet. But it's um, it's the anniversary of the death of Flash's mother. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he goes to the farmer's market with Iris. The art is really weird in this one, by the way. I don't like the faces uh, in this issue. It's very strange. Um, and so he goes to New York to get pizza. And he realizes when he is uh, 2,087 kilometers, um, or sorry, miles into his journey that he doesn't have his flash ring and his costume didn't pop out of it. Uh, which is funny because, yeah, of course his clothes would blow off. Um, 
that's most of the way to New York, by the way, for reference. He's like... He's he's probably about 70% of the way there. 72% of the way there. It's hard to say exactly. Um, but yeah, he, let's say he's around 70% of the way to New York. Um, and he realizes he doesn't have his flash ring. So... He basically has to backtrack and figure out where exactly he left his ring. He doesn't find it until he goes to the arcade he was at with Iris earlier. I'm going to skip a couple pages for copyright reasons. Um, so he goes to an arcade in town and he sees that it's actually owned and operated by the trickster. And what the trickster has done is he actually happened to find Flash's ring on the ground. And he's turned it into um, into a game uh, at his arcade in order to draw interest, to garner attention for his business. And so he basically has to play arcade games in order to get his ring back. And so he's been getting people to take bets on what Flash is going to do, how fast is going to do it. <clears throat> Excuse me, a bit of a... <clears throat> Bit of a clogged throat this this evening, this morning, and um, so the Flash takes part in some of these games, and eventually the Trickster reveals that he's teamed up with all of these super villains, all of these like game based or puzzle based super villains, and so he throws the Flash ring to them, and says catch, and so they all scatter. Much like in Marvel Spider-Man, where you gotta catch all the bad guys who scatter after a, a break-in. And, um, so Flash tracks one of them down and chases him and catches him, um, a decent bit into, into the city. And he realizes that it's actually a hard light hologram, or maybe not even hard lights, it's just a hologram. And basically, when Trickster put those goggles up to his face earlier. He he determines that he must have had a camera planted on Flash's mask um, by by doing that, and so to project the the image and trick Flash into taking part in this game um, without him being aware. And you can see that the avatars were being controlled by uh, each of these four people respectively. And so the Flash goes back. And the trickster basically tells him to, um, like, tell him what the ring does and how the ring works and why he needs the ring so badly. And he'll give it back to him. And so Flash basically says, oh, yeah, you know, it's the source of my power. I need it to be the Flash. It's my connection to the Speed Force. And basically to to activate it, you just hit the little, <laughs> you hit the little uh, release on the side. And um, anybody who is even remotely familiar with Flash comics will know that the release on the side of the ring causes his costume to fly out. And I was talking to my brother about this, and I was saying, you know, Flash could probably use his ring as a weapon if he really wanted to, but it would probably kill people with the force at which it pops out. Um, and it wasn't until this point that Flash, at least to my knowledge, it wasn't until this point that Flash actually acknowledges, like, how hard it does fly out of the ring. And so the figure Flash gives us here is nine airbags of force um, with which his, his like, uh, metal costume type thing flies out of the ring, his costume paneling. And um and so the trickster points the ring at himself like an idiot and and hits the release and it flies out of the ring and knocks him out cold. And so um the <laughs> this this may be the day that his mother died, but now there's a new memory formed by the flash. Because it's also the day that he tricked the the uh, trickster and got his ring back, and so it's a happy memory to to sort of go along with the horrible memories of, of obviously his mother's death and the subsequent incarceration of his uh, his last parental figure. Um, but anyway, so we get a reveal of Doctor Alchemy, <laughs> the most sinister foe of all, and so. Um, Next issue, we're going to get a, uh, presumably a, a conflict with Dr. Alchemy, and I can't wait. 
who's the writer for this? Hold on. Because this is a the start of a new era of Flash in, in a way. Um Kevin Schmick. Kevin Schmang. <laughs> Kevin Schnick. I don't know. Schnick? Kevin Schnick? <laughs> Clayton Henry on art. Um, but yeah, this is the start uh, in many ways of a, of a new era. It's the closing of Joshua Williamson's run and the, um, the start of a new. And I really enjoyed this first issue. So if this issue is to be used as a, uh, a benchmark, then... The rest of the run should be really, really fun and really, really enjoyable to read. Um, man, these books are easy breezy. It's like a cover girl. Yeah. <laughs> I um, my point is that I've been blowing through these these flash issues every time I pick it up uh, every two weeks, and it feels like I'm reading you know uh, a short story because of how like easy and breezy and fun it is, and how easy it is to lose yourself and not realize like how many pages you've actually gone ahead and read um anyway so i'll, I'll talk to you guys later uh, <laughs> i've got some interesting stuff coming up uh the king of black next month i'll be reviewing that presumably as it comes out um along with the black cat tie-ins the venom tie-ins the iron man tie-ins and uh, maybe another one? I can't remember. But there's a really cool Iron Man and Doctor Doom book that seems to be coming out along with The King in Black. I don't know how that relates. Um, I was going to pick up Namor, but I realized it was five issues. And, uh, there's no way I'm reading five Namor. I'm, I'm paying for five Namor issues for a, for an event that's not even remotely connected to Namor. Um, if you want to read Namor, go read the john Byrne namor run from the 90s or just wait six months for it to come out on comiXology um i've been ethan ainsworth and i'll talk to you guys later